We begin our conversation with the incumbent tonight, Steve Troxler in the monitor. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Oh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. A lot of new voters in North Carolina. Tell us who Steve Troxler is. Well, I am a lifelong uh, farmer. I was educated at NC State University. I have a degree in conservation, and I have been four times elected Commissioner of Agriculture in North Carolina. What have you learned over four terms? What I've learned is uh, there are so many facets to agriculture and agribusiness in North Carolina, and it does start at the farm level, uh, but then that, that money is multiplied through the economy many, many times to the point that agriculture and agribusiness is North Carolina's number one industry at $92.7 billion. How do you weigh, as, a, as an elected leader representing government, how do you weigh how much to intervene in that industry versus uh, leaving them alone to do what they need to do? Well, for the most part, the free market works, and uh, our industry in North Carolina is very diverse. Uh, over time, we have become the third most, uh, uh, third most diverse state agriculturally in the nation. So the less interference that we give to the industry, the better. But we do have rules and regulations that we enforce in the department to make sure that uh, things are fair and the consumer is protected. So if you're a new North Carolinian, because thousands move into our state every year and all, and it, it can be confusing what our agricultural industry makes up. When I was a kid growing up in this state, hogs and tobacco were the key staples of Sampson County agriculture, but tobacco not so much, I guess. What is hot out there? What's making farmers money? Well, uh, tobacco is still an important crop in North Carolina, uh, but the number one industry is the poultry industry uh, in this state. But we lead the nation in many different categories. Uh, sweet potatoes is a huge crop in North Carolina. Uh, turkeys is a huge crop in North Carolina. We rank number two in turkeys. So. They, we do a lot. Uh, I mean, people would be amazed at the, the number of commodities that we rank in the top 10 in the nation. I mean, take fresh market uh, strawberries, blueberries, trout. The list goes on and on. We grow cucumbers in North Carolina primarily for pickling. We rank high in the nation in that. So we're very diverse and, and we work very hard to make sure that that diversity remains in agriculture. Now, from your position, do you nudge the industry towards certain crops or certain uh, product lines in agriculture at the expense of others due to technological advance or environmental concerns or politics? Well, uh, certainly not politics, but what we do is we do agricultural research in conjunction with NC State and NC a &T State University. So we've got the science and the numbers to show the farmers what the chances are that these crops could be profitable uh, and be profitable long term. So many votes are going to come out of urban counties in North Carolina and these cities like Charlotte and Raleigh are growing. What do you say to urban voters when they're casting ballots for an agriculture commissioner who probably do most of his or her work outside of a city? I think the pandemic has proven how important agriculture is to the consumer that's not in agriculture. Uh, when those grocery shelves started to get empty, when the meat counters didn't have meat in them, I think people in the cities had to kind of back up and look and say, well, maybe this stuff doesn't grow on the shelves in the grocery store. And we certainly hope that they realize how important agriculture is to North Carolina and we feed them every day. From a policy perspective, and you're the Republican incumbent, Republicans generally like free trade deals. Many Democrats like free trade deals. As current Republican president, not so fond of free trade deals. What position does that put you in representing agriculture and trade for North Carolina and exports and imports? Well, before the, the trade wars and the tariffs and everything, we were very successful in North Carolina exporting products all around the world. We have a, an international marketing division in the Department of Ag, and at any one time, we're somewhere in the world selling these products. So uh, if you think about it, 95% of the mouths to feed in the, in the whole world live outside the borders of the United States. So free trade is very, very important to us and agriculture. And as soon as this pandemic is over with, we'll be out there again making sure that these products are all over the world.
Now, your Democratic challenger was in the studio for an interview. We've, we've already talked to her. She'll be later in this program. I do want to ask you, she said that when it comes to hurricanes and recovery and resiliency, the state should do more than just cut people uh, or especially farmers a check for relief. There needs to be a resiliency plan, environmental focus coming out of the State Department of Agriculture. Uh, what do you say on that? Well, what, what I can tell you is uh, every time that there has been any type of disaster in North Carolina, the Department of Agriculture and I have been there before, during, and after the disasters to help people get through it and to get back on their feet. Uh, as far as resiliency is concerned, farmers themselves are resilient. If they weren't, there wouldn't be any left after what we've been through in North Carolina. But we work through research primarily to help farmers understand what the complications are of flooding, uh, of drought. And what I like to say is the, the constants in agriculture are that it's always too hot, it's always too cold, it's always too dry, and it's always too wet. So how we develop policies and how we do uh, research to help farmers get through these constants will be key to their success. Do you find farmers are engaged on this whole idea of the, the, the climate change issue, or are they looking to respond to what, as you said, are they responding to what happens, or are they coming to you saying something is different? We've had two storms in two years, hurricanes, droughts, and floods. I think they do uh, understand that something is different. Uh, and I've said many times, the climate is changing. The climate's been changing since record, before recorded time. There's evidence that uh, the ocean was up to Raleigh at one point in time. We know we lost the dinosaurs and the big animals off the earth. So yes, the climate is changing for how long, which direction it goes, is it temporary? I don't think anybody knows, but we've got to deal with it. We farm outside. Let's talk about, so what, dealing with it, coronavirus? Um, cost us the state fair this year. It's not been very fun, and you were supposed to bring a bunch of fun to a state fair, got to be in Sea <laughs> Festival. But coronavirus and COVID-19, a very serious policy matter. How's it affecting agriculture? Well, it absolutely has. It's affected uh, agricultural markets. When you think about uh, when we close restaurants, we close schools, universities, uh, we switched 50% of the food uh, from institutional food and being eaten outside the home back to the home and all of the groceries had to come out of the grocery store. So yes, it has very adversely affected farmers and the way they have to think about markets. One thing I've noticed down eastern North Carolina, those conservative counties, one of the new crops coming out is, is hemp. And now there's been an abundance of hemp crop. I hear they're sitting on, some people have a year's supply of, of industrial hemp. What do you think about these new crops like that? Is, is, is that going far enough or do we need to stop there with the hemp growth? Oh no, uh, we have a new crops initiative that we're doing in co uh, correlation with NC State University. And we're always looking for that next crop that can provide a profit to farmers. Uh, the problem is uh, a lot of people jumped into the hemp industry. Uh, it was the market was not there before we produced the, the product. So we overproduced. Uh, is there a future for hemp uh, in the future? Yes, probably, but not at the level that people went at it this time. Uh, and the key is going to be developing the markets and having a regulatory framework that ensures uh, what people put in a product is in the product. We know that was not true this past year. Yeah, well, if hemp's overproduced, I know a lot of farmers try to get into asparagus and other, other common vegetables, maybe not common to North Carolina. What could be the next emerging crop uh, under your watch if elected the next four years? Well, you know, we're doing research on things like uh, stevia. Uh, stevia is a hot ticket right now as a, as a sweetener. We can grow it here in North Carolina with refined production techniques. Uh, purple carrots is another one that we're looking at in North Carolina. And, and even more exciting, I think, is we have developed in, in uh, correlation with NC State University, the Kannapolis Campus, Commerce, and EDPNC, uh, the NC field, the, uh, the lab for innovation in food products. And what that can do is if we have uh, 
new food products that people are developing here in North Carolina. Certainly we want to encourage them to stay in North Carolina and do food manufacturing. And that in itself opens up new opportunities for different crops that we can grow here in North Carolina. Well, a million of us were looking forward to the state fair and I alluded to it in my previous question, but you made a health care call on, on canceling it for 2020. What's the outlook for the state fair once we get beyond this pandemic? You know, I think 20, 2021 will be the best state fair ever. I think there really will be pent up demand for people to come to the state fair. Uh, this past legislature, le legislative session that just ended, we did get some relief from the legislature that we had to have to move forward with the state fair. Uh, without this relief, we would have been out of money probably by the end of the year uh, and had to mothball the fairgrounds. So we're set to go for 2021. We're planning 2021 now, and I think people will be amazed at what they see. And what about all the events so many people attend outside of the state fair? All systems go. What does it take getting us to stage three or the complete all clear or a vaccine to say, let's go full green light at the fairgrounds? Well, the, the problem with the fairgrounds is it has not been us canceling events. It's been people that canceled events because of the concern of crowds. So as soon as it's, uh, it's okay with public health to do this, we've had clearance from public health to do several types of events at the fairgrounds, but the public wasn't ready. Uh, and I think you see that with restaurants and, and all kinds of different things. The people have not gotten out of their mind the seriousness of what can happen in crowds. And as soon as that goes away, everything will be back to normal at the fairgrounds. We have 45 seconds left. What are you seeing out there in the rural versus the urban areas with using the mask, being fearful of COVID-19 and coronavirus? I have family terrified of it. I have other family like my mother who is full tilt, going to live her life. Uh, what's your take? Well, I think probably there's more awareness in the cities. Uh, and the urban areas uh, of the seriousness of it, I, I wouldn't say awareness of it, but if you live in a rural area, you don't see many people, you're not around people in large crowds, so you kind of stay to yourself and it's easy to do, but when you're, you know, when you're in the large cities and there are the crowds, then it needs to be taken very seriously. Uh, and we need to get through this and, and maintain the, all the health we can maintain. Steve Troxer, Republican incumbent commissioner of agriculture, seeking your vote for re-election in 2020. Mr. Troxer, always good to see you. Thanks for dropping by for a conversation. Thank you.